and thank, welcome to the Revelation of Jesus Christ, a study of the book of Revelation, and it is the revelation of Jesus Christ and what he had to say concerning the time in which you and I are living. You need to understand that, that this book is dealing with the time we're living in, and it's very, very important that we understand what the book says because it's speaking specifically to us. And so we hope that as we've been going through this book of Revelation that it has been a blessing to you and helped you understand what we're t looking at. This particular series we've entitled Final Events because we're looking at verses or chapters 17 through 22. And uh, today we're taking a look at the 20th chapter of Revelation. 20th chapter of Revelation, a very, very vital chapter as we go through it. We hope it'll bless you in the study of God's Word. Uh, our subject that we're looking at is the millennium, the thousand years, thousand years of peace. Uh, I can remember talking to a lady about this subject once, and as we were talking about it, she said to me, she said, uh, oh, we're already into that millennium. We're already there. And I said, we are? And she said, yeah. I said, we're already there. I said, well, my Bible tells me that the devil is chained up during that thousand years. And she said, he is. And I said, the devil's chained up? And she said, yes. And I said, it has to be on a rubber chain because he gets around to me quite often. <laughs> See, well, what we're going to try to find out today is when does that thousand years start? When does it end? What goes on during that thousand years? Where is the devil? Where are the righteous? Where are the wicked? All that has to be fit together. And so we hope that you'll follow carefully in your Bible. If you have your Bibles, follow with us. Uh, get a piece of paper and uh, write down questions you have or points that we're trying to make. And all of, those, all of you who are watching by television, we welcome you. If you're listening on the radio, we welcome you, or even today, if you dialed in or however you do it on the internet, we're glad that you're tuning in to what is being said. We hope it'll bless you in a special way. Uh, our next presentation is chapter 21 of Revelation, which is the New Jerusalem. And God gives you a picture, a word picture of the New Jerusalem. Marvelous the things that are involved in this new Jerusalem that we'll be looking at. So you don't particularly want to miss that presentation on the new Jerusalem, which is our next presentation. But today, we're going to take a look at the question of the millennium. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us the His Voice Quartet. Uh, we have been so blessed by having them here and enjoy their music so much, and I know you'll be blessed this morning also. Before they sing, though, Chuck Allgaier is going to come and read with you the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation. Good morning. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we're going to go through Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And I'd like for you to read along with me. So if you have your Bibles, turn them to Revelation chapter 20, and we'll read together. Let us read. Then I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, cast him into a pit, into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And now I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who hath a part in the first resurrection, over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, 
and they shall reign with them for a thousand years. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to see the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints of, and blood city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne in him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. The books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades were delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged each one according to their works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. May God add his blessing to his word. This is what I call settling in for eternity. Say that again. This is what I call settling in for eternity. There are certain things that has to be done. And we have here a thousand years that is set aside for that purpose. The righteous have to know in their own hearts that God is totally and completely just. The wicked, the wicked have to also understand that he is just in carrying out the punishment for their rebellion. And the entire universe has to know that God is just. Thus, for righteousness to reign throughout eternity, these things have to be taken care of. So, we'll take a look at this thousand years and what takes place during that time that God has given for that purpose for you and I, settle in for eternity. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, which is the devil and Satan, bound him for a thousand years, bound him for a thousand years, cast him into a bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So the devil is bound for a thousand years, not able to deceive the nations or anything for 1,000 years. It says, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the... In the what? Yeah. He who has part in the first resurrection, over such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So the scripture tells us clearly that this thousand years begins with the resurrection. It begins with the resurrection of the righteous because it says, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. So all the righteous, all those that have accepted Christ, all those that have given their lives to him, all those who have walked with him, they will come forth from the grave first. Okay? Then the scripture says, but the rest of the dead, 
did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Now, if all the righteous have been resurrected in the first resurrection and come out of the grave, then who is left? The wicked. That's the only ones left. So when it says, the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished, that can only refer to the wicked. Okay? So it tells us that there is a thousand years between a first resurrection and a second resurrection. That's what the Scripture tells us clearly. That's a thousand years. And in John, it even clarifies it more because it says here, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave will hear his voice and come forth. Okay? All that are in the grave will hear his voice and come forth. Watch. Those who have done good to the resurrection of what? To the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So you have two resurrections. You have the resurrection of life. This is the one in which the righteous are resurrected from the grave. And you have the resurrection of condemnation in which the wicked are resurrected and come forth in the grave. Two resurrections separated by 1,000 years. Now the Scripture makes it very clear that there are five events that happen and take place at the beginning of this thousand years. Those five events are as follows. One is the second coming of Jesus. Nothing is going to happen concerning this thousand years until Jesus shows up. But with the coming of Jesus, then that thousand years will begin. And we find that Jesus is going to come back as King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and on his hand, or, and in his hand a sharp sickle. So Christ is coming back. He's coming back to claim his people. Coming back to gather all the righteous coming back to set up his kingdom that will last how long? For eternity. Okay. So with the coming of Jesus, the thousand years begins, and with the coming of Christ, certain events begin to happen, and one is the righteous are all resurrected. Jesus comes, and as he comes, it says he will shout, his voice will roll through this earth like peals of the loudest thunder. And all those that are in the grave are going to hear his voice and come forth. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. They're going to come out of the grave at the call of Christ. Do you know why? Hmm? You see, when you accept Christ as your personal Savior, He gives you, He gives you a new nature. He gives you a spiritual nature that is in tune with Him. And so when He comes and calls, that nature responds to that call. And you will come forth from the grave. You and I will come forth. Oh, I can spend time, but I won't. But you come forth in that grave, dear friends, with nothing wrong with you. I mean, everything is right. Nothing wrong. No sickness, no sorrow, no death, no pain. All that is forever gone throughout eternity. Okay? They come forth from that grave. Then it says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. That means perfect. That means nothing wrong. Incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal 
put on immortality that will be given to all the righteous. Glorious. Marvelous hope. Can you take hold of it? Can you, can you take hold of it and say, yes, we'll receive that. Comprehend, if you can, eternity. Eternity where there will be no sickness, no sorrow, no death. Then it says, all those who are living. Now, we've just been talking about those who were dead, all those that have died in Christ. They've been resurrected. But now the living that are on the earth at the time Jesus comes back, it says all those people are going to be translated. What it means is they're going to be changed and caught up with those. Listen. Then we who are alive, that's the righteous on the earth, and remain shall be caught up together with them. That refers to the righteous that are dead, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So it says that they're going to be resurrected. They're going to come up out of the grave. And those people that have been resurrected and come up out of the grave are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in there, and all those that are on the earth alive when Jesus comes, the righteous, all those people will be changed, and they will be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. So God has gathered all of his children to meet him. Okay, what about... What about the wicked that are living? What about all those people that are on the earth when Christ comes? And by the way, folks, the Bible doesn't teach anything about the righteous being whisked out of here and nobody knowing it. It doesn't teach anything about that. That's strictly a fairy tale. That's not Scripture. Okay, but the wicked... The wicked that are living on the earth, the scripture says this is what happens to them. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of its place. Uh, I want to ask you something. If the sky rolls back like a scroll, and islands start disappearing, and mountains are moving around, do you think people will realize something's going on? Now, yeah, not very secret, okay? And the kings of the earth and the great men and rich men and commanders and mighty men and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains. Said to the mountains, the rocks, fall on us. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. Who is able to stand? You better believe that the wicked know it. They're aware of it very, very clear. They're saying, who can stand before this? And it tells exactly what's going to happen to them. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, okay, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it makes it clear that the wicked will be destroyed, if you please, by the brightness of his coming, by the very fire. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So the wicked that are living, when Jesus comes, they are slain, if you please, by the brightness of his coming, as if a fire covered the whole earth. Well, that's what happens to the wicked that are living. What about all the wicked who were dead? What happened to them? Well, they're not disturbed. 
Let me tell you something. When Jesus comes and he shouts and his voice rose through this earth and the righteous that are dead in the grave, they hear that voice and they come out of the grave. They respond, the wicked don't hear a thing. They're not disturbed in the grave. They don't hear a thing. They just continue. In fact, they do not show up again for 1,000 years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the end of the 1,000 years. So 1,000 years takes place before they come up out of the grave. With the resurrection of the righteous and the translation of the living, they are taken to heaven. The wicked that were living are slain. The wicked that were dead are not disturbed. And thus, the devil is bound. You see, it says that he was bound. Listen. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key, in his bo a key to the bottom of his pit, a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, the old serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, cast him in the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. You see, with all the righteous in heaven... And all the wicked dead, the devil doesn't have anybody to tempt, does he? No, he's bound. It doesn't mean when it says he's bound with a chain. Do you think a chain would hold the devil? Huh? No. Chain wouldn't hold him. But it says he's bound or he's chained for a thousand years. You ever had somebody come over to your house and say, uh, go to town with me? And you said, I really would like to go with you, but I can't. I'm just tied down. What do you mean? Well, you just meant circumstances wouldn't let you go. And that's the same thing here with the devil. The circumstances have bound him. The righteous are in heaven. The wicked are dead. He's bound for 1,000 years. Okay? The wicked are dead. The earth. The Bible says is emptied. It's a desert. And the devil and his angels are here for 1,000 years. It describes it with these words in Jeremiah. And at that day the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. The wicked will fall and there they will be till the end of the thousand years. Thus the devil is bound. At this point the scripture says that judgment is given to the righteous. Interesting idea that judgment is given to the righteous and by the way let me ask you something. When is judgment given to the righteous? Huh? Yeah, during the thousand years. You clear on that? You do not have it now. Do you understand that? You don't have it now, so don't be judging. And don't even tell me you're a fruit inspector. You're not even that. Okay. It's given to them during the thousand years is when it's given to them. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast in their image, had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So the righteous are given judgment. It goes on and says... Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? 
Yes, the righteous judgment will be given to them. Why? Why? I mean, isn't, isn't what God said good enough? Why, why would judgment be given to the righteous? Well, the Bible says one thing for sure, that sin is not going to rise up the second time. What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up the second time. That will not happen the second time. Well, God doesn't intend for that to happen. God doesn't intend for someone to bring up something or to have sin rise again. So God intends to answer every question that the righteous might have. In other words, have you ever, ever thought about it? Do you, what, what's going to happen? What's going to take place when you get to heaven? Is God going to turn some little key back here and all of us become stooges? Is that what's going to happen? Huh? No. I think God's going to let you use your mind. In fact, uh, I think we'll use it more than we do now. At least I hope so. Well, if he is, let's say you get to heaven and there's somebody that you thought ought to be there that isn't there. I mean, somebody you thought for sure would be in heaven and, and here you look around and they're not there. What are you going to do about that? You're going to say, ah, oh, better not say anything. Wonder, wonder why John didn't make it. Oh, I better keep quiet. Strange that John didn't make it. Wonder why he didn't. Let me tell you something. God doesn't intend to get 10,000 years into eternity in the hall all of a sudden have you say, Hey, where's John? He's going to answer that question. Going to answer it for every person exactly what happened to each individual and why they aren't there. That's why the books are going to be open and the righteous are going to go through them and they're going to know that God was perfectly loving, kind, merciful, and just in all that he did. And let me tell you something, dear friend. If you don't make it, it won't be God's fault. Because he is doing all that he can to see that every one of us make it into the kingdom of heaven. And so the righteous are going to go through the books and they're going to see that God was just in everything that he did. And thus, judgment is given to them. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, sorrow, nor crying. You see, dear friend, there has to be some tears in order to wipe them away. And that's what that thousand years is for. To settle it once and for all. So that there'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more pain. All that, all the questions will be answered. We will be settling in for eternity for sin never to rise again. This is what he's doing for us. There shall be no more pain for the former things are passed away. Well, like at the beginning of the thousand years, there were five events that marked the beginning. There's five events that mark the close of the thousand years. And wonderful things. The righteous have spent a thousand years up in heaven. That's beyond my comprehension. But think of it. Spend a thousand years in heaven. Where there will be no struggles and all the things that we face now. But at the end of the thousand years, the new Jerusalem that Jesus 
has prepared, because he went and made a, pl a place for his bride, okay? That city that he has prepared is going to come back to this earth. And I'm going to say more about that in our next presentation. But you see, this is going to become where the place where God dwells. It's going to come to this earth. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Comes back. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Marvelous. That's what we're going to look at in the next presentation, so I can't get in to this city and talk to you about it now. But if you miss it, shame on you. It's marvelous what it should be that is prepared for you and I. But that new Jerusalem comes and settles here on this earth. The Scripture even tells you, folks, exactly where it comes to. In the book of Zechariah, it tells you exactly where it comes to, to the Mount of Olives, there how it settles. That's where that city will set. And marvelous will be that city. For the righteous have lived in now for a thousand years. Okay. With the new Jerusalem coming back, the wicked, all the wicked that are dead, that have been in the grave now for a thousand years, they're resurrected. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. And so we've come to the end of the thousand years, and all the wicked come out of the grave. Oh, what a difference that is. What a difference that is. All those who were resurrected in the first resurrection are resurrected incorruptible, are resurrected immortal. No sickness, no pain, no sorrow. Everything is absolutely perfect. Those that are resurrected in the second resurrection, no change. No change. If they were blind, they come out of the grave blind. If they went into the grave sick, they come out still sick. No change. Please mark it, there is no change physically for them. There is no change for them character-wise. Mark it down, dear friend. Put it down. It's now. It's during this time that you develop character. You don't develop character after the resurrection. If you're playing around and thinking that all of a sudden God is going to zap you and you're going to become loving and merciful and kind and good and all that. You're kidding yourself. That's not going to happen. If you have trouble loving the brethren, dear friend, be careful, because you've got to learn to love them before the resurrection, not after. They come out of that grave, the wicked, just exactly like they went into the grave. The devil is released out of his prison. You know why? Hmm? Oh, he's got people. All of a sudden, all the wicked have been resurrected. They're as thick as the sands of the sea. And now he's got something to work with. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the what? 
nations which are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number as as the sands of the sea. They're thick as the sands of the sea, and now the devil is going out to deceive them to battle. Why? Let me ask you something. Why don't the wicked and the devil, why don't they just say, well, the new Jerusalem's over there, and the righteous are in it, and we'll just leave them alone, and we won't bother them, and we'll go over here on this side of the earth, and we'll live here, and maybe they won't bother us, and we won't bother them. Why don't they just do that? Well, let's go back to the beginning. It says that those wicked, when they come out of the grave, they are resurrected just like they went in. That means, dear friend, they do not have immortality. And the Lord God said, Behold, man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubims at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. God said, well, man's going to take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, he put an angel guarding it so that man could not eat of it. Do you know where the tree of life is now? And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. So the tree of life is inside the New Jerusalem. And the New Jerusalem is now on earth. So the devil tells the wicked, if we can just get inside the city and eat of the tree of life, we'll live forever. And so, they went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city. The wicked go up to take the city. Maybe they can get in and eat of the tree of life and live. This is where the Scripture says that the great white throne judgment takes place. Because inside the city are all the righteous that have ever lived. They're inside the city. Outside the city are all the wicked that have ever lived. So there, at this time, all humanity stands before God. And it says that he's lifted up above the city. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the book. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. There is no change. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. There all mankind is. There is no change at this point. And there God stands before them all. And mankind realizes and understands that God has been just in all of his dealings.
They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. You see, every one of us, I don't care whether you're righteous or you're wicked, every one of us are going to come forth in a resurrection. You're going to be resurrected. It doesn't make, you know, who you are, you're going to come forth, either in the first resurrection or in the second, you're going to come forth. But the righteous will live and the wicked will die. Because it describes it with these words, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy conduct and godliness? Earth is going to burn. And all the wicked and all the works of the wicked will be burned up. The new Jerusalem will ride those waves of fire just like the ark rode the waves of the flood. The righteous will all be inside the city. They'll be cared for by God. And then after the fire has purified this earth, and remember, we're talking about settling in for eternity. After this earth has been purified with fire, there will be no signs left of sin and degradation. It will all be gone looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved. Being on fire, the elements will melt with fervent heat. It's all going to burn. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You see, to you and to me, the righteous, we may die the first death, but I don't have to die the second death. The wicked die twice. They die the first time, and then this is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire because this is the cleansing of the universe. This is the cleansing of sin. It will be eradicated from the earth. Nevertheless, we too, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which what? Righteousness dwells. Look for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Then death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Oh, dear friend, let me take just a little time and appeal to you. Don't pass up the opportunity. I mean, this is the time God has given to you it's given this time to you to have the opportunity of spending eternity. The Lord Jesus Christ left heaven, came to this earth, and died that you might have this opportunity. It's strictly up to you to accept it. God is not saying to you, you've got to do certain things to qualify. I was talking to a group of fifth graders 
And I was talking about how that this gift is a free gift given to us by God. And this little fifth grader said, do you mean all this stuff my parents tell me I've got to do, I don't have to do? And I said, well, the only people that will get to heaven are those that qualify. And he said to me, well, okay, what do I have to do to qualify? And I said, well, the only people that get to heaven are sinners. And he said, well, I qualify. And so to you, I would just say, each one of us, we qualify. Jesus Christ said he did not come to call the righteous. He came to call the sinners. He came to call you to give you life, to give you hope, to give you something much, much better than this world could ever give you. He made that possible for you and I to have eternal life, to dwell with him for eternity. Earth will be made brand new. All this stuff that we put up with out here, it's going to be gone. There won't be such things as pollution. All that will be gone. It's a new earth. Then the king will say to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Come, all you. I've prepared a kingdom. I've prepared a place just for you. Think about it. There'll be no more sin. God will have been justified in the eyes of the universe. It will be settled that he is just that he is righteous, that he is merciful, that he is kind, that he is loving, that he's all those things. And God just simply says to you, come, enjoy, enjoy the things that I have prepared for you. I made it just for you. And then down through the ceaseless ages of eternity, all the righteous will be able to live and rejoice and enjoy all the wonderful things that God has prepared for those that love him. It's my prayer that you will definitely plan on being there. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you today realizing, Lord, without you, we are hopelessly lost. That we have nothing, nothing to recommend ourselves to you but our great need. And we come today with that need asking, Lord, that you'll cleanse us. Take away all the sin and the selfishness. Make our lives clean, pure, white in Christ Jesus. Lord, make us kind. Make us gentle. Make us loving. Give us, give us, Lord, in great abundance, the Holy Spirit. May it fill our hearts. May the fruits of the Spirit be manifest in our lives. And may all of us have the privilege of being with you in your kingdom, not because we deserve it, Lord, but because we've accepted Christ as our Savior, we put our faith and our trust in Him, and we look forward to that day 
in which he's going to be coming back. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our next presentation is on the New Jerusalem. Wonderful place that God has prepared for you and for me. And let me tell you, he has some certain things in mind for you and for me that you don't want to miss. So we hope that all of you will be with us. God bless you.